Just about set the goal here. <laughs> All right. I have been offering talks on mysticism and astrology for about 53 years. At one time, I used to give uh, two talks every week. One was on mysticism and one was on astrology. But then other responsibilities came into my life, and now aging is having an effect on me, so I have slowed down a little bit. As you know, there are only two talks per month. Uh, one on mysticism, uh, one on astrology on the first Thursday of the month, and one on mysticism on the third Thursday. When I did two talks a week, the astrology talk was always on Wednesday, and the mysticism talk was always on Thursday. Now that there are only two per month, all of the talks are on Thursday. Now there's a reason for this, and it's not to accommodate to the scheduling of the world. Uh, I'm not something I'm inclined to do. <laughs> I do my own thing and that's it. The reason for the scheduling is astrological, but it is not the astrology of horoscopes. It is what could be called cosmological astrology, or it is commonly called revolutionary astrology because it involves a lot of revolutions, cyclical changes. Now the revolutionary astrology is a much larger and more inclusive astrology than mere horoscopy. When you work with horoscopes and mundane astrology, you're working with stars and constellations and signs and planets and houses and aspects. That's all. But the cosmological astrology is much greater than that. You might say that uh, the, the astrology of horoscopes is a subset of the greater kind of astrology. But the two kinds of astrology share some things in common. And they sh what they share in common is the idea of quality. And in all forms of astrology, qualities are usually given planetary names. And those planetary qualities, uh, whether they are from, uh, from revolutionary astrology or whether they're from horoscopy, uh, have gotten into our language. We say that a person is jovial, or we say that a person is martial or mercurial, uh, or Venusian or something like that, and we're not even talking about astrology, or they're just part of language now. The cosmological astrology deals almost exclusively with qualities. And, um, for example, if a mystic says something has the quality of Saturn, the mystic is not talking about the planet Saturn with the rings that, that the astronomers look at. It is speaking, unless they say specifically that they're speaking about that planet, it's talking about the quality that has the name Saturn. Now, in these talks on astrology, we've talked about the Saturn period and the Saturn revolution and the Saturn globe, but when we do that, we have not at all been talking about the planet Saturn. The planet Saturn is a, just that, a planetary body. And it is a personification of the quality of Saturn 
that is uh, associated with that planet while the, while the solar system exists. When the solar system ceases to exist, the planet Saturn will cease to exist, but the quality of Saturn will not. It's um, a more eternal thing. Now, we're talking about spiritual qualities in a creation in time and in space. So when we're speaking about a Saturn globe, we're talking about a formation of matter of some kind in space. And when we talk about a Saturn revolution, we're talking about a change or a period of change or a revolution of consciousness that has the quality of Saturn. And similarly, when we're talking about a, the Saturn period, as we spent a, a few talks doing, we're talking about a period of spiritual manifestation in time. Now, it's exceedingly difficult to become used to this, especially for people who have an astrological background because they have that limited view of what something Saturn, Saturnian or Saturnine is. What we're trying to get at is, suppose you have a period of time. A period of time can have a mood, and the character of that mood can be described by uh, astrological, um, as astrological language. This ha we find this throughout everything. We say that uh, a movement in a symphony has a slow, dirge-like quality. You could say that is Saturnine. Where I live, we've had a very cold, wet, slow-to-change spring. You could say that this was a spring that had a Saturn character about it. In that period, or in any period, you can imagine formations coming into form and dematerializing, materializing and dematerializing. And you can understand the formations as having given, given qualities. They may have a shape, they may have a texture, they might have a substance or something like that. We have that, we see that in, in the material world. We look at an object like a bowling ball and we say it's spherical and it's got holes in it and it is hard and things like that. Now, as consciousness in the evolution is passing through differing formations in differing periods of time, there are differing ways that things can change, and those are what the revolutions of consciousness are all about. So, periods, globes, revolutions follow a regular sequence. It's a sequence that is carried analogically throughout the entirety of the creation. In mysticism, the principle of astrology, which is sometimes associated with the hermetic axiom, is uh, the, the understanding is the all. In some ways, you can even determine your state of consciousness spiritually by how well you analogize things. Now, I'm, I have tough notes this time. <laughs> this is a tough, tough night altogether. Within, suppose we're watching something change, change like a spring, or take something like a cold weather front coming in, or take a sunset. If you look at a sunset, if you're looking west, you see the... Uh, uh, the light change from almost white to yellow to orange, and almost, then it becomes red right before the sunset. Now, when we see that in motion, we don't notice that within that period, 
when it passes from one hue to another, that there are many hues in between. You can say analogically, using uh, analog uh, computation, you can say that it's smooth and even. But if you're sampling, you can sample one color and you can sample another color so that you can say in the glory of a golden sunset that there are many sub-periods of time that have qualities of their own. Now cycles, as they change in consciousness and as they change in evolution, they also have sub-periods. We've been talking about revolutions of consciousness, but those revolutions of consciousness, within each of them, there are sub-revolutions. That is, there are sub-cycles within major cycles. And there are sub-sub-cycles, and the uh, breaking things down into what you might call micro-mini... Uh, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> that just brought some, some an association to my consciousness that I'll give it in just a second. But there are many um, there are, are many sub cycles within a given cycle. Just like in the, in the spring, each day is different, and each day of spring is a sub cycle within the entire spring. Now the thing I was smiling about is I was going on a bus through Peru and uh, looking out the window, and uh, <laughs> there was a little store, and <laughs> the, the, the sign on the store said, um, Micro Super Mercado, <laughs> which means it was big and small at the same time. It's strange how you, when you're using words and you're trying to tune in and being, trying to be astute and aware of everything and intuitively uh, tuned in how, how funny different things come in. So there are sub-cycles and cycles within cycles within cycles. Now, what we've been talking about are great periods of the evolutionary creation. These great periods take eons and eons, if you can even measure them in our kind of way of thinking about time. But within the sub within the cycles of the, uh, the periods, there are the revolutions. And then there were, within them, there are sub-revolutions and such, so that it goes right down to the hours of the day. There is, in the revolutionary astrology, each hour has a different quality. And the qualities have uh, astrological names. And uh, the order of the uh, qualities is Sun, Venus, Mercury, Moon, Saturn, Jupiter, Mars. This is this sequence of um, planets or planetary qualities is called the Ptolemaic order. Sometimes it is called the Chaldean order, but it is. Um, it is a sequence of qualities, so that if one hour is a sun hour, the next hour will be a Venus hour, and the next hour will be a Mercury hour, and it goes on in that order. Now, the planetary hours each have a quality to them, but you have to be sensitive to pick it up. Some people are unconscious and respond to it, and they're more, more grumpy in some hours and not so much in others. Uh, same thing, some people are more, more jovial. Now the hours that are used in this revolutionary astrology are not 60 minutes long. The only time the hours are 60 minutes long is at the equinoxes. The way it works is the, the time from sunset, sunrise to sunset is broken into 12 equal parts. 
And if you live in the north, as I do, uh, in the summertime, the day from sunrise to sunset is much longer than 12 hours. So the 12 planetary hours are much stronger. And those are the diurnal hours or the daylight hours. Uh, on the other hand, the time from sunset back to the next sunrise are shorter than an hour because that is less than uh, 12 uh, 60 minute hours. So what you have are diurnal hours and nocturnal hours. And they vary according to your latitude and according to your season. Uh, in or for most people, you have to consult uh, tables to determine what the planetary hour is. Unless you're really sensitive, you can, uh, uh, you can pick it up from your own feeling. Now, the, um, suppose you're looking at Sunday at sunrise, and let's, let's just say that. Then a question comes up, how do you know it is Sunday? There are several ways that this is determined. There are societies that have maintained what day of the week is associated with what, uh, with what planet, and they have these records going so far back into time that nobody knows where they originated. Some say that it was taught by the gods. Now, these kinds of records are kept scrupulously. Like, for example, the Jews have the Sabbath, and they never vary about what day of the week is the Sabbath. But you actually don't need a calendar. You don't actually don't need some kind of a record book to tell you what day of the week it is. Because you're going to think I'm crazy about this, but because the sunlight is different on Sunday. Now, if you're a sensitive person, you can uh, determine that. And sometimes it's even obvious. Like if you look at movies that are made in Argentina, the light in the movies is different than a movie that is made in Europe or a movie that is made in Africa. Different parts of the world, the light has different qualities. And it doesn't have to do what the film is or anything like that. It is the light itself. But if you're sufficiently sensitive, you can tell that it's a Sunday because there's a certain kind of bright light that is only present on Sunday. There was a time that I was, my personally, when I was very young on the spiritual path, uh, I was super sensitive. If somebody was sitting in a chair and got up, I could sit in that chair and tell you what was on that person's mind. And I could tell you when a planetary hour changed from one hour to the other hour and what what the what the whether it was a Saturn hour or a Venus hour or anything like that if you develop the sensitivity you can you can do that so back to where we were the first hour after sunrise the day begins with sunrise for this the first hour after the sunrise on Sunday is ruled by the Sun the second hour is ruled by Venus, Mercury, Moon, Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, and it goes back around again to Sun, uh, and that's how, it, that's how it is determined. Now, the, this order is, <laughs> is based in, in Ptolemaic astrology. It's based on the heliocentric system, and the heliocentric system goes such that... Uh, it goes by speed. The moon is the f fastest planet. The next fat fastest planet is Mercury. The next one is Venus. Then you have the sun. Then you have Mars. Then you have Jupiter. And then you have Saturn. So you have sun, Venus, Mercury, moon, Saturn, Jupiter, Mars. And it goes cycling like that through all of the planets. So you can see then that each hour has a quality that is all its own. And you can see that the planet that rules the first hour after sunrise, when, it has, when this cycle has gone through all 24 hours, 
the first hour and the next day is uh, <laughs> Monday, Tuesday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So it, the days of the week are determined by this same cycle. And people try to associate each week with a planetary ruler, and I have not seen anybody be very successful with that. And the same is true each month being associated with a planetary ruler. You can do that with the signs of the zodiac, but that isn't part of the revolutionary astrology. So uh, there are other divisions, like, for example, the great mystic uh, Le Comte de Saint Germain gave a cycle of 35 years that uh, every th you know that this cycle would go through 35 years and that whole 35 year period would have a quality just like uh, Saturday has a quality or the first hour on Sunday has has a solar quality that there would be 35 year periods uh, when I was studying uh, history a little bit not a lot a few years ago I noted that in the period a period of around 350 years, which makes me believe that it might be associated with Saint Germain's idea, there was a period that there would be a quality to 350 years or thereabouts. So that if you take from uh, the late 11th century, from 10 something or another, and the next uh, 350 years you have the periods, that was the periods of all the Crusades and all of the Knights, and that clearly was like a Tuesday. It was like a Mars day. This was succeeded uh, in the early 1300s by a, uh, a Mercury day, meaning that this is when there was the alchemy and hermeticism and things like that, and that prevailed for about 350 years. Then things switched to a Jupiter day. And in that Jupiter period, Jupiter rules expansion, especially rapid expansion. And uh, Jupiter indicated um, the time of all the revolutions took place. And we're about at the end of that period now. And we're about to go from a um, Tuesday to Wednesday to Thursday. We're about to go to a Friday period now. So some form of art is going to probably take over from uh, the a focus on, um, uh, on revolutions and political expansion and things of that nature. All right, that's all on the side. Now, it's very hard. Now, St. Germain was open about little 35-year periods, and the hours and the days have been known for uh, time immemorable. But all of these periods, how they go all the way back to the very beginning, the Saturn period, the Sun period, the Moon period, all of these things go way up to that largest of all things. So the whole creation is based on this same kind of revolutionary astrology. But you don't know, uh, you don't know exactly relative to our time how this, when the changes are going to be made. What are these periods? I think I discovered a 350-year period, but I don't know exactly when it changes, because if you knew that, you could get in on the ground floor or something, and you would have an advantage that uh, other people don't have. Uh, like using regular astrology with horoscopes and things like that. There's a field called mundane astrology, and some people do make predictions based on the positions of the planets in the heavens, but often they fail. And the reason they fail, or one of the reasons they fail, is that there is nothing ripe in the other astrology, which is the astrology of the whole creation itself. And uh, that is what determines the great and major changes. So this information is usually kept highly secret. And the reason for it is, is because people do not have the moral character to not use it uh, to their own advantage selfishly and to the detriment or harm of other people. Hints about how the regular astrology of the planetary orbits and things like that, how that relates to this astrology, if you could get that, you could do quite well 
uh, in making major predictions. At one time, uh, Rudolf Steiner gave hints on how you could do that, but a British mathematician spent his entire life trying to work off those hints, and he never cracked it at all, and so we're still in the dark. But the good thing is, if you become a morally pure person and your whole life is dedicated to the removal of suffering, unnecessary suffering in people, and to getting people to be in harmony with the great creation, then you get initiated and you know these things because you know that these are times when help is going to be needed and a person can offer what service that they have to help the situation from beforehand. Which doesn't mean making a prediction because uh, making predictions, uh, people aren't usually wise about that. Uh, they, you know, they're out for their own skin and they take panic and they make things worse instead of better. All right. So, we have this other astrology, and we've been talking on, the, on a very large level, the days of the creative days of the week, which are not the same as the ones given in the book of, of Genesis in the Bible, and we'll eventually get to that, uh, but we're going rather slowly. All right, so we're... Right now, we've had Saturday with Saturn's, uh, the Saturn period. We've had Sunday with the Sun period. And now we're ready to go into the Moon period. There's only one thing we have yet hanging. The reason the classes are given on Thursday, because Jupiter is a day of generosity. And people are more willing to be open and accepting to my personal idiosyncrasies and some of these rather unconventional ideas, which I don't, you know. There's all of this, even the days of the week, that used to, uh, even nations in the world with their revolutionary astrology, that used to be the religion of the times. It wasn't very exact, but in ancient times, people still knew that. Uh, now it's, it's, it's a lost and forgotten thing. It'll be discovered again in a, in a much better way. So these classes are on Thursdays to get a better, uh, more generous hearing. And another reason is because Jupiter rules abstraction. And as you well know, I do a lot of abstracting. All right. Let's look at the moon period in a manner a little bit different from the way we have looked at the others. The difference is not a completely different outlook, but it, it, the difference is in emphasis. We're going to emphasize something more uh, about the moon period than we did in the others. And the thing we're going to emphasize is environment or atmosphere of consciousness. Now, when we looked at the Saturn period, we said that it was a period of warmth or a period of heat and that it was dark. That we didn't say much more than that. We said it was like a black light or something of that nature. And when we came to the sun period, we said that everything was light. Everything was ablaze with light and the heat was actually increased. You couldn't really say it was a flame because there were, it, it, was, it wasn't pure radiance and it wasn't quite like a flame either. It's a different kind of light. Now, we're trying, in trying to understand the environment of the moon period, we're trying to understand how the things that we developed and unfolded or planted the seeds for in the moon period, how the moon period environment was necessary for that to be done. Now, we have to get at something that is very unpleasant and to me very difficult. We're talking about what is basically 
in our times in the Earth period, the current period that we are in now, we're talking about the solar system, but the solar system didn't exist as a solar system in the Saturn, Sun, or Moon periods. But we're talking about the birth of a star and a star that has or will eventually have uh, planets to it. Now, the ideas about the birth of stars agree and disagree with the same ideas of materialistic science. The common theory of the creation of a solar system and planets within it is called the nebular hypothesis. We're not going to go into it very much, but just enough to give you a rough idea of it. And I don't want to spend too much time on it because while it has features that are true to the general creation of a star, basically the idea of it or the basis on which it is founded is untrue. It's materialistic. Uh, so the materialism believes that everything, including your love for your fellow man, is a result of personal interactions of matter. Yeah, you know, like if you if you had a different breakfast, you might not love your wife as much, or something like that. That that's that's sort of making fun of it, or, but the whole idea is uh, materialism thinks that everything comes out of matter, and this includes uh, a solar system itself. But there are some things that are analogous to the materialistic recreation of the system, the solar system to which we belong, that are, um, that are analogous enough so that it's worth going into it, even though the basic idea that everything is created out of matter is itself false. Now, if we're very careful, we can do this. Now, roughly speaking, according to the Neff-Muller hypothesis, there are several stages. At the beginning of it, space dust or space gas or space particles are attracted to each other. It's, the attraction is um, uh, gravitational. And the gravitational th th things are brought together. And when they're brought together, the momentum of their coming together produces a rotation. And gradually, larger and larger clumps uh, are come together. And as they come together, they heat up. I guess from, uh, partially from propinquity, partially from momentum. Uh, but they, they, they come to a stage where the nebulous is a glowing gas. And that glowing gas forms a ball and it has a disk formation around it and it's all spinning together. And then gradually it cools down because the attraction is uh, slowed down. We still have some attraction that comes from stuff out in space, clumps, things like uh, uh, comets and things of that nature. Um, and when it slows down, the rings inside the rings around the planet, uh, around the central sun, the planets form. It was cooling down, and a lot of them, like our Earth, still have hot central cores. At the same time, the central mass, where everything came together, is a thumor, is through thermonuclear reactions, uh, fission, not fusion, fission, it producing all of this energy, uh, helium and hydrogen and such like that. Now, the full theory is pretty technical, but that's the way the claim is that a solar system is made. Now, the assumptions of this system are based on materialism, and that is the opposite of mystics. The mystics claim that uh, everything that happens is a consequence of something higher. 
That is to say that there is a spirit with purpose that caused things to happen that we now in our material blindness look at as being something random. So there is, in materialism, there is an inversion, and in that inversion we get things backwards, uh, and we get things inside out. All right? <laughs> this is not going as terribly bad as I thought it was going to go. It's not going well either, but it's not too bad. Now, what I'm going to say now is just very loose. This is not a science talk. This is a sequence of ideas to get the gist of something. And the gist that we're trying to get is the, uh, how the atmosphere or the environment of the moon period so that we can get to what was done in that period in the in next and future talks. Now, what we're going to say is going to be a, a little critical uh, comparatively or contrastingly uh, with materialistic view, but it's not a critique, which would, would be, have to be something really uh, documented and detailed and such. It's only about what we're going to talk about is star formation. We're not going to talk about bigger things like what materialism, again, sees as a big bang. Uh, we're, that's, you know, that's a, a, the scope of things is way too large, and it's way out of what we're trying to do. The first criticism of um, the materialistic view is that it is based on random actions. That it was a random thing that these particles came together. And it wasn't intentional. There was no purpose. So that's 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 one major difference you know some people find uh, like for example the greatest proponent of materialism in our times uh thinks there is no purpose to the universe and you know like the highest thing in human consciousness is purposeful living and doing things with a purpose that uh, uh, is edifying and that is helpful and that has creative beauty to it. And that is a result of accidents. It, it, <laughs> it doesn't make any sense to me. All right, the next is a, an inversion or at least a partial inversion. And that is the heat was not generated along the way. In the nebular hypothesis, the heat builds up from the uh, momentum and things coming together. What I'm going to say is going to, may sound crazy, but the heat was there from the beginning. The Saturn period was a period of heat. That's at the very beginning of the creation. And the heat is a consequence of sacrifice. Heat, in a spiritual sense, is a consequence of sacrifice. Uh, how to say it? We were, we were in a blissful, all-conscious state, but we were not self-conscious before the creation. We were called virgin spirits. But we volunteered to go along with the creation and we sacrificed that blissful state to enter into a uh, unconscious state, a deeply unconscious state. And that sacrifice, that plunging of spirit into matter, even though the matter was only divine spirit, which is rare beyond our comprehension almost now, uh, that produced heat. Now, all of the other beings that participate, the creative beings, uh, the hierarchies, the gods, if you want to call them that, uh, the Elohim, as they're called in the Bible, they sacrificed also, but their sacrifice was a little different. They knew the dream, and they were participating in the dream. But, in, you know, it's a great temptation 
to live in the dream and not to actualize or actually realize the dream. Because things never work out and it's always hard work when you try to realize a dream. And to enter into the creation when you know the dream that is behind it is a sacrifice. But all of those beings did sacrifice. So it, you, you, you can say in the same way that they knew that they, they weren't going to live only in the dream. They were not going to be daydreamers anymore. They were going to be dream doers instead. Uh, they, uh, they were filled with inspiration. And you might say, it happens to us, it happens to me uh, quite frequently. When an idea or a creative notion is hot, you can't help but to express it. And that is the kind of resistance that was involved. Now, in all of these things I'm saying, materialists hardened, especially materialists, would say all of this seems like delusion. It all sounds like fantasy. And it sounds more like... Uh, creative, uh, poetic delusion. And the mystic would say, poetry can say things that didactic science can't possibly say. That is not to say that poetry gets everything right, but there are intuitive, insightful things that can be only said in that way because if you put them into a machine-like consciousness, it, it doesn't work. It, you know, emotions are not like that. Uh, creative ideas are not like that. And that's the way. Communi so communication isn't the highest form of communication, but it's a pretty high form, and uh, it things can be brought through by doing that. Now, in both the spiritual cre idea of creation and the nebular hypothesis. There is a period where things heat up and then another period when things cool down. But it's for different reasons. Now the heating up in materialism is mostly done by friction. In mysticism it's mostly done by a buildup of creative uh, uh, momentum, you might say. You warm up to a creative activity. At some, you know, sometimes when I start doing some of these notes, eh, I'm sort of blasé about it. But when you start sinking into something, it gets you get deeper and stronger, and you you're under the heat of a creative moment. Now, please remember that we're talking about a creation that is well before the chemical physical world even existed. And uh, the chemical physical creation of a star and that it is in our Earth period, which is all that uh, material science knows, is a recapitulation. All right. We're trying to do... We're, you know, this brings us back to what we're trying to do. We're, we're understanding the nebular hypothesis and we're using a critique of it to understand the spiritual view on what takes place in a creation and how the spiritual view gives a more full and comprehensive understanding of what a being, especially a human being, is and how we can understand that. So, all right, so now let's get back on track and um, look at uh, a parallel of nebular, uh, the nebular hypothesis and the mystical hypothesis. The statement of mystics of various varieties is that in the moon period, the atmosphere was moist. Now this brings up all sorts of other questions, and it brings us to things that we don't have a language for. 
our language is extremely paltry in trying to uh, trying to describe things or explain things. Now, sometimes the inability to explain things is because we don't understand them clearly, and we don't uh, know them well enough so that we can verbalize them. But uh, even if we understand something quite clearly, uh, there are, sometimes there are things that were, there aren't words there. So, when we hear moisture, and the moon is associated with moisture, and the moon is associated with the fluidity, we think of water. Now, the most dense, uh, the most dense that the cosmic creation was in the moon period was as dense as the etheric subdivision. And the most dense of that is the chemical ether. So there wasn't the atoms like the, mat the material atoms we have now of hydrogen and oxygen. So there wasn't any H2O as we know H2O. But there is a formation like that that is the parent of what in our, in our time in the Earth period is water, that is H2O. And what we're trying, you know, we're dealing something that we're dealing with what might be called a proto-water. But the proto-water has the same qualities as water has now. Uh, remember, the ethers are the source of life. And uh, uh, what we're talking about in the, in the dense globe of the moon period, the densest globe was in the ethers and it was in realms of life. And so what we're talking about as a manifestation of the creation in energy and in life. And water is very important to that. For now, we can say that the, in the inner worlds, even in the ethers, there is a counterpart for everything that exists in the physical world. So there is a counterpart to water, even if the formation of water and the substance of water isn't as it is now. Okay. We're very far away from the notes. This always happens to me. Uh, I've never given a talk where I've given everything that's in the notes. Something is always left out. But there are always new things that aren't in the notes that come out in the talk. <laughs> so it's a curious thing trying to give a talk, especially with very, uh, with very uh, particular, uh, particular notes. Now we want to understand in, let's, let's be in the physical world, but not in the, in the physical world as physical, as physical science is exclusively with the attitudes, uh, the skeptical attitudes and the materialistic attitudes. We can use the physical world as an analogy to understand how all of this works. All right, we're trying to get at the moisture that is of the moon period. And that can be demonstrated with uh, something really simple, something you learn as a Boy Scout. I don't know if Girl Scouts learn it, but Boy Scouts learn it. And that is a fire stick. A fire stick is a stick that's usually about that long and around like that. And it's got a, it's got a tapered to a point, but not a sharp point, but to a blunt point. And that fire stick is made to fit into another piece of wood in which there is a concavity. And in that concavity, you put tinder. And then you hold the stick into the uh, concavity and you go back and forth, back and forth, and you rub and you rub. And as you rub, the friction heats up and eventually there is smoke and eventually there is a glowing in the tinder. And then by very carefully 
blowing on the tinder and adding more tinder and eventually more fuel of different kinds, but the careful blowing and all of that, you get a flame. And then out of the flame, you can produce a fire. That's a fire stick that, uh, you know, primitive man, primitive humans knew how to do that. Uh, Boy, Scouts, Boy Scouts are pretty primitive. It was pretty primitive, primitive when I was in the Boy Scout. Now, this is an analogy to moisture in the uh, moon period as seen from the material plane of existence. In the material plane of existence, there is the greatest amount of friction. First, you have the rotation and you have the heating up. You can't see any fire. You have the heating up and you have the spinning universe with globes and uh, revolutions of consciousness. And then you produce out of that a flame. And then in the material sense, <laughs> it's something invisible help happens. When there is oxidation, when there is a flame, when there is burning, invisibly water vapor is produced. So this is a this is a materialistic analogy, but it gives you the idea uh, in a simple way in our simple consciousness that we can see how the different periods of evolution, we, can, we have something and we can see how this works. And, you know, as long as we recognize that, this, that it, it, it wasn't uh, exactly like that, like we have it here in the physical world, but it is, uh, it is analogous and it helps us to understand. Now... This image is really a materialistic illusion, but it's, you know, it works from friction, which is a bottom-up exercise. The true creation is a top-down exercise. It's like you could say that a creator could not create, but out of the generosity of its nature, it must create. And when it does so, it, sacrifice is the heat and that's that's you know that's the way things uh, work from the top down now you've probably noticed by now that we're spending a lot of time in description which we didn't do with the Saturn or the Sun periods and um, we're doing this because we're trying to make the information that is shared we're trying to make the sharing, the method of sharing, like the information. And we're talking about the moon period, and the moon period is, Im it is important to understand the environment because understanding the environment more helps you to uh, uh, realize the experience of it in yourself. Now, in these talks, we've talked a lot about the number four. We said that the number four and the geometric counterpart of it, the square or the right angle, are represent the principles of construction. You can't build a house because of gravity that's out of square because gravity will eventually pull it down. And even the matter itself is based on the right-hand rule of a field forming around a vector of energy and so that is, you know, the, the stuff that you're building with or constructing with is based on the square. Now, we have mentioned it, but we haven't looked at it uh, as thoroughly as we are going to do now, which is still not very <laughs> thorough, that the globes, the seven globes, occur in four worlds. Three globes are descending, three globes are ascending, and one globe is partially descending and partially ascending. And the globes occur in worlds or in major subdivisions of worlds. And those 
worlds or subdivisions of worlds the, that the globes are that the work is being done on in the in the globes uh, are um, are the fields of activity and they are so there are on, in these four worlds if you look at it even the periods there are three periods descending three periods ascending and the earth period in which we are now comes into matter and then out, so it is the turning point. So we have four levels of periods, just the same way we have four worlds or major subdivisions for globes, and actually it's in the revolutions, three revolutions down, one turn around, and three revolutions up. So there are four levels of uh, revolutions relative to matter. And what happens oh, <laughs> with the number four, things happen in stages. There is a quality to each of the four stages, and the quality isn't a result of the stage, but the stage is a uh, manifestation of a universal quality. And, oh, how to say it. If you live somewhere other than in the tropics, the building process of a year where things come to life and die back occur in four seasons. And each of those four seasons has a quality all of its own. I have dear friends that live in Colombia. and <laughs> There are seasons in Colombia, but it's nothing like uh, a frosty fall night or the first smell of the earth when the, when, the, when the frost comes out of the ground and you smell that rich earthy smell. You don't get that in Colombia. Now, the four qualities are behind, you know, I'm saying the number four points to something that there is quatripartite. And the qualities of the uh, quatripartite parts are something that are universal. They're manifested in seasons. And what they are called is elements. Not elements like copper or molybdenum or something like that, but basic creative elements. So the elemental quality of the Saturn period was called fire. That's, that's a universal quality everywhere in the creation. It has to do with even the handing down of destiny. There are the four winds or the four lords of destiny, or the four recording angels. They're all names for the same things. And they are the four elemental beings that govern uh, material creation. Again, we have that building of the number four. Obviously, when air is added to fire, or when intellection is added to the activity of the Saturn period, you have the element for uh, the sun period as being air. The element for the moon period is water. And this is something that we're going to look at again and again, but for now we're saying that water, for its ability to uh, support life or for its ability to transport things from one state to another, is the quality of the moon period. So there is some coincidence here between the idea of, a, of an encompassing moisture that allows things to grow in and become specific in their own ways, as we're going to see along the way, uh, that, is, that with that and the element of water are tied together. So now we have two ways of looking at things. 
we have look at things from the nebular, nebular view where we produce moisture as something invisible and it changes the environment and the moisture itself does cooling, it insulates and it, you know, the air, air coming in to fan the flames, so to speak, is cooled by passing through water. And so you can see how these things build on each other even in simple material, uh, in material things. Now, we want to look at this in one more way. <laughs> We're already at an hour. We want to look at this in one more way to get another feeling of the environment or the atmosphere of the moon period. Now let's look at the worlds or subdivisions in which the activity is done, in which the globes form and deform in the moon period. Those are the abstract subdivision of the world of thought. That's one. The concrete subdivision of the world of thought, that's another. Going deeper into matter, the desire world is another, uh, another world in which something, in which the creation takes place. And the final of the four is the etheric subdivision of the physical world. So we see there are a number of things that um, are important in this. The, if the, this means that, how to say it, the densest that the creation was in the Saturn period was as dense as a concrete thought. The densest that uh, the so the creation solar manifestation in the sun period was as dense as a desire. And now in the moon period, we can see that the creation became as dense or as materialized as ethers. If you want to think in terms of a science language, it became as dense as a magnetic field. There are formations that even science uh, recognizes. There are formations that are uh, etheric. And they are not necessarily vague and fuzzy or nebulous. They can be quite definite. Uh, if you look at, there are all sorts of gorgeous photos on the internet of uh, northern lights. And they're gorgeous, and they have definite shapes, and you so you and those shapes are indicate currents in the uh, magnetic field of the Earth or in the etheric aura of the Earth. So even though we're saying that the uh, cosmos was no more dense than a magnetic field or the ethers, doesn't mean that it was indefinite. That there, you know, there, there, you you can. You can be, deal with things that are rare without being vague and fuzzy. Uh, some people are vague and fuzzy even about very concrete and distinct things. All right. Now we want to look at a distinction in this. And the moon period is uh, cosmographically more distinct from the Sun and Saturn periods. Because in those periods, part of the active direct creation, the four worlds in which things were done, were in realms that are called pure spirit. Those realms are in the, in the Saturn period, some of the work was done in divine spirit, some of the work was done in life spirit, and those are realms of pure spirit. Uh, more was done in the region of abstract region of the world of thought, and then uh, abstract subdivision, and the concrete subdivision. So as much was done in pure spirit as was done in, uh, uh, in something manifest. 
Now to understand this, we need to understand the difference, you know, the, the re abstract subdivision of the world of thought is considered a spiritual world also. It's a transcendental world. It's above concretion. In fact, it's called the realm, another way of looking at it is called the realm of human spirit. So, how, what is different? The difference is that the abstract the subdivision, the world of thought, is the world of ideas. And ideas have an internal structure. And that internal structure is universal. It's the same wherever you are. Two pi r as the uh, uh, as the manifest as the relationship of a circle to the radius is universal, no matter where you are. But life spirit and divine spirit do not have that internal structure. In the region of abstract subdivision, one generates ideas, and those ideas can be formulated. That doesn't happen. In life spirit and divine spirit, they spirit. <laughs> it's using spirit as a uh, verb because their very being is spiriting. Now, there is a relationship between these realms. Now, the ideas of abstract thought are a manifestation of the, oh, how to say it, pure imagination of life spirit. Now, concrete thoughts are manifestations of ideas. Out of one idea, you can spawn many concrete thoughts. Ideas are spawn of pure imagination. And pure imagination is a consequence of a will to be. So you have a will to be, and then you have lively being, which is light, what life spirit is all about. But human spirit is a being, and therefore it has that separation, that distinct quality about it. So, <laughs> the realms in the moon period begin with abstract thought and go all the way to life spirit. So they have none of that pure spiriting. This does not mean that, these, that the life spirit and divine spirit do not exist. It just means that they do not directly participate in the action of the, uh, of the creation. They sustain by providing the spiritual background. So this means the environment of the moon period is very different from the previous periods that came before it. And that difference is, it's not quite like deism. Deism is a belief that divinity exists and it, does, it, after, it, it creates things and then it walks away from them or just watches as, as if it were watching a comedy or something like that. But um, uh, it means that the spiritual background is radiated and the creative intent is still there but the direct activity is removed from pure spiriting. And it's like saying, all right, go away now and do your thing. It gives a, a, a different attitude. And you're on your own, so to speak. So that's, that is a major factor that makes the moon period, the environment of the moon period, very different in relation to the other 
preceding periods and in, in relation to the whole. And we're going to see this carried further. Now, I left a lot of material out of, out of this. <laughs> uh, ideas, for example, are universal, like the idea that 2 pi r is a circumference of a circle. Now, you can't do that in concrete realms, but you can do that in abstract realms. You know, because pi is, is an idea that is infinite, carries on. But you can't, you know, this is, you know, people have, they string many computers together to carry out how many digits they can of pi, and that's a mania of trying to square the circle. That's how much of mathematics was generated by people trying to square the circle. All right. There's a lot of things in here that I thought I had a great time with them uh, bringing them out, but I can't do everything in the talk. We're already uh, uh, at uh, 70 minutes. So for now, let's say we have, uh, we've come to three things. We have said that there is a moist, vaporous, protective uh, atmosphere or uh, environment. It has that quality and to some extent even that substance. The second thing we came to is that we have the element of water and water in all of its aspects as an intermediary between uh, air and earth, between uh, lofty floaty thoughts and drag down material forms. It has that mediator quality. Water does that. My water is, uh, uh, there's just so many, I, I get very frustrated in doing these talks because there's so many wonderful examples you could give, but you can't give them because there isn't time. It would take another 10 minutes or so. And we have that we have, uh, the third thing that we have come to is that we have an environment or an atmosphere of creation, creative independence. We are on our own without the constant, immediate, direct uh, assertion of pure spirit. So we got three things that, under, that give us a, an idea of what the atmosphere of the moon period was like and a little bit of why they are. Now from here on we go into why they are and what is accomplished and how the, how the character of the environment of the creation changes according to what is being accomplished within that changing environment. And we'll start doing that in the next talk. Uh, thank you very much. I'm sorry I tried to, I'm greedy. That's my mis one of my great mistakes in life is I try to do too much and uh, I would probably get more done if I tried to do less. Thank you very much.